Hey, Val, that brings you to the boxing gym. I'm here because you are. I'm sorry I couldn't talk at the hospital. I know about your patient. I'm so sorry. We lose patients all the time. Sometimes those patients are very young. But I saw you talking with her parents. That must have been very difficult. Conforming the loved ones, all of it is just part of the job. You know, even I know that when a priest takes his vows, it's more than merely a job. It's a vocation, a calling. And from what I've seen, you approach being a doctor the very same way. So losing a patient, someone special to you. You can't just shrug that off. You can't work out your frustrations in the gym. You need to talk. You need somebody who will listen to you and understand. I'm fine. Clearly. No. Thank you for trying to help. I just, I, I need to be alone right now. <laughs> well, then you, Dr. Griffin, are a hypocrite. You think I'm a hypocrite? Yeah. <coughs> you tell everybody else to reach out for help. You've practically beaten down my door saying, here I am to reach out to. And you fought me all the way. Yeah. But honestly, if it wasn't for you, I'd be at home, alone, downing martinis in the dark right now. Instead, I have hope. Not tons of hope, mind you, but just enough. There are times I even consider facing my future. Well, I am glad I can help you, but right now I just, I need to be alone. For what? Why? To wallow? To indulge in a crisis of faith? You need somebody to talk to. Anybody. It doesn't have to be me. I'm just standing here right in front of you. You've listened to me. Why don't you let me listen to you? Because I have nothing to say. I don't think that can possibly be true. It is true. Because beyond feeling a profound sense of loss, I don't know what else there is to talk about. So tell me, how did you get this way? Feeling so deeply for your patients, you know me. <laughs> Empathy has never been my strong suit, so I just... I'm curious as to how it happened. Okay. When I was a boy... Things were pretty harsh. But watching, watching my mom struggle and growing up without a dad, I, I had to keep my guard up. We have that in common. And I became an altar boy. Of course you do. I know it sounds corny, but it's the truth. And before you even ask, my priest was a good man. He treated us like we were God's children. I found comfort in God. And the, and the church, I was able to see beauty in the world, and I came to believe the priesthood would be my life. And how did you become a doctor? At seminary, my superior noticed I was reading biology almost as much as theology. I, I needed to understand the how and the why of the human body and where the human soul fit into that. Oh, hence neurology. Exactly. I thought my superiors would balk at the idea, but it was the opposite. They encouraged me to follow both paths. That must have been tremendously challenging. And rewarding. I discovered that I could make a difference. I doubted my calling as a priest. I always knew I, I, I could do something as a doctor. Even when patients died, I knew I could ease their suffering. But Marisol... Marisol's different. I really thought, really thought that I could save that little girl, and I failed. It brought me back to how harsh things were when I was a boy, like nothing ever changed, like I should have never let my guard down. With all due respect, Father Monroe. You really are missing the point.